I just, I'm telling you, I blew some out of the water today, this myth. I went to the dentist today. I hadn't been to the dentist since 2007. I hate the dentist, not the dentist, you know, the person, but I hate what they do. I hadn't been to the dentist since 2007. My mama always taught me, you know, brush your teeth two times a day, always floss. I hadn't flossed since 2007. <laughs> and I got there today, I had, one, I had one small cavity. She told me, for somebody that hadn't been to the dentist in 2007, she said, your mouth looks fantastic. I blew that myth out of the water that you got to do all that stuff that they told you to do every day. Y'all don't. <laughs> Unless your parents told you to do it. Don't you disobey your parents. But for your older people, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. That was good news for me, you know. Because I'm telling you, I went in there and I thought it was going to be terrible. I really, I, my appointment was at 8. I, wasn't, I didn't think I was going to make it here in time. I thought it was going to be that bad. But I got out of there in time. My lesson tonight is on church growth, but not just church growth, it's on church growth through trials. And it's coming from Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn over there with me to Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. It's no, normally <coughs> we don't connect growth with trials. A lot of people don't because, number one, we're distracted by the trial, so we can't see the growth. It's like when a bad storm comes and it just tears your house up or it tears your shed up or it, tears, it, it throws a, a limb somewhere. Uh, we're so distracted by the destruction, we can't see the rain that watered the flowers. We can't see the rain that watered the grass. We can't see the rain that watered the trees that are growing. Why? Because we're so distracted by what's, what's bad, so many bad things going on until we can't see any other growth around us. And that's how it is a lot of times with the church. When there are problems happening in the church, we cannot, we absolutely cannot see any type of growth. Now, there are two types of growth that I, I, you know, I focus on from time to time, numerical and spiritual, spiritual first. But if we're talking about both of those, spiritual and numerical, obviously we can see the numerical growth should not be our focus. Our focus should only be spiritual growth. Because if you focus on spiritual growth, which you should, that's what you're supposed to be focused on anyway, God would take care of the numerical growth. That's what, that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says. Paul says, it's our job to plant, it's our job to go in water, and if we do what we're supposed to do, then God will take care of the numerical value. So I'm focusing on spiritual growth tonight that leads to numerical growth. And so when problems are going on in the church, and all churches have problems, even you, Roebuck, you're either having some now that you know about, you're having some now that you don't know about, or you've had some in the past, or you will have some in the future. That's just the way it is, church. That's just life. And you know why? People say, oh man, there's so many problems in the church. You know why? Because you've got human beings in the church and nobody's perfect. Yes, including me. And so when these problems and these trials arise, and you know, I'm going to show you tonight that the trials come from different places. They come from the outside. They come from the inside. They come with, with uh, uh, the battles that we have within ourselves. But the whole point is, when the trials come, we can't see any good going on around us, even the growth. Because we're too busy focusing on the bad. We do that in our own personal lives. Something bad happens. The, the next two weeks that we focus on what bad just happened, the next two weeks we miss all the blessings that God is sending our way. So how do you get church growth out of trials? Well, let's can we look at? I want to look at three things tonight. I want to look at, first of all, undergoing trials, which basically I'm going to talk about the reality of trials. I want to look at um, responding to trials, how do we respond to trials, and then I want to look at the benefits of trials. And I'm going to try to gain some concepts from Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. So first of all, undergoing trials. The church during this time definitely underwent a lot of trials. 
And so let's look at some of those. Let's look at Acts chapter 8. And let's start at verse number 1. Acts 8, verse number 1. Notice what it says. Now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking about Stephen. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now here's persecution. Here, here are trials that the church is undergoing. These trials are coming from the outside, from the apostle Paul and all the people associated with him. He was making havoc of the church. He was dragging men and women out of their homes. Imagine you sitting in your home and somebody comes in your home, kick down your and because you are a Christian, they drag you out of your home. Imagine that for a second. That was a trial that they were going through. Now, we hadn't reached that point yet in America. But if some of y'all don't start standing up, we may. I ain't going to charge you nothing for that. And let me get back on my lesson before I get started. So when we look at the trials... The reality of the trials was certain then, and it's going to be certain in our time. Look at Acts chapter 9, beginning with verse number 1. Paul wasn't through. Saul at that time, he wasn't through. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Trials. The church was facing trials. And Paul was looking to drag them out. Look at verse 20 through 23. This is after Paul became a Christian. And watch the very same thing Paul did to the church. Watch what's getting ready to happen to him after becoming a part of the church. Look at verse 20. Immediately, Paul, Saul, he preached the... Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not uh, he who destroyed those who are called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, Damascus, providing that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days uh, were passed, the Jews plotted how they might kill him. You see, these Jews got upset with Paul because he had changed his life. They got upset with Paul because everything he thought he knew that was right was wrong, and he changed from that, from the wrong to the right. And they didn't like it one bit, and they wanted to kill him. And I'm telling you, when you decide to change your life and live for the Lord, some of them friends that you used to hang around that you don't hang around no more, they're going to get mad at you. And when they get mad at you, they're going to bring up everything you used to do in your past. They're going to say, oh, you think you are all and sanctified now. You can't hang with me anymore. We were just at the club Saturday night. And maybe you were at the club Saturday night. But that was Saturday night. You're a Christian now. Just don't be there this coming Saturday. But it's not going to stop. You're going to be persecuted because of the change that you make in your life. Just make sure it is a change indeed. And so the reality of trials and persecution for the first century church, it was certain. Now, how did they respond to the trials? Let's go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through verse 5. Acts 8, that's y'all, y'all got on red shirts. I mean, what's going on tonight? That's impact. Okay. I'm, I impact a lot of people when I walk around with you. Tank dog, I impact. Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse number 4. After they were beginning to be persecuted, watch what happened. Watch how they responded. Verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Okay. Verse 26. 
Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. And so he arose and he went. And he found an Ethiopian eunuch there. How did they respond to the trial? I can tell you what they did not do, and you listen very carefully at this. These people did not allow the trials and tribulation going on in the church to stop them from working for the Lord. It ain't no vacation time when it comes to following Jesus. You don't get, vaca you don't get vacation time when you go to the beach. You don't get vacation time when you go to Disney. And you do not get vacation time just because a few problems are in the church. I don't care what kind of problems are going on in the church. You cannot stop working for the Lord. You can't get mad at God because you're mad at somebody. I ain't doing nothing, Frank. He ain't going to do me like that. So, if anybody here named Frank, I'm not talking about you, dog. <laughs> Please forgive me, bro. I, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about Frank, whoever he is, wherever he is. I did that in Georgetown, South Carolina about two weeks ago. I I, I've been calling this guy Brother Addy since I've been there. And I said, stop going out drinking with Fred. The guy named Fred, y'all. <laughs> the preacher. Fred Addy. So you got Frank right here. You got God right here. And here are you. And so what happens is you're mad at Frank. And instead of you getting upset at Frank, and turning your attention solely on God and dedicating your life more fully to God, what you do is you get mad at Frank, you look at God, and you turn your back on both of them, and you go this way. That's not how it works. If you get mad at Frank, that should make you want to get closer to God. And you know when you do that, that's going to bring you right back over here to Frank. That's why we can't never fix no relationship. Nobody want to. We so stubborn. We so stubborn and stuck on what we want. We don't want to fix. Now I ain't going nowhere. Let him come to me first. He 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 did it. She did it. Let her come to me first. And we don't even realize Matthew 15 doesn't say that. Matthew 15 says, if somebody does something to you, you go. Check behind. Why does it say that? Because they may not know that they've done something wrong. And so these people here, when the, when the trials and the tribulation came and the persecution came, the Bible said they were scattered everywhere. And the Bible says, while they were being scattered, they continued to preach the word of God. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Philip did like the Spirit told him and went and found the Ethiopian eunuch and he preached Christ unto them. Trials and tribulations are time to where we regain the strength that we have and preach the gospel and we do it. We do not let trials stop us from proclaiming the name of Jesus. Don't get mad at God because you're mad at a situation. Don't you stop being faithful to the services of the Lord's church just because you're upset with a situation. God didn't do anything. Don't take it out on him. But also, let me show you what else they did. Turn back. I want to go back to Acts chapter 5. And I want to look at verse 41. Uh, let's start with verse 40, Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. It says, Peter, the release, it says, After they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. We've got to get some courage when it comes to trials, especially the trials from the outside. You get on Facebook or wherever you go and you get to talking about Jesus and you get to talking about what's right and what's wrong and what culture needs to be shooting for and what culture needs to be getting away from. And the first time somebody, first time somebody gets on there who, dis, who disagrees with you and starts uh, 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 calling your name and making you look bad and feel bad, 
you stop posting about Jesus. We got to stop that. We got to stop that. Who, you, who are you serving? What's your purpose in life? As long as you have the right attitude, it should not make a difference to you what anybody says about you if you are proclaiming what is true, what is right, what is moral, and what is about Jesus Christ the Lord. It shouldn't matter. Let them call you whatever they want to call you. Say thank you. This wasn't about anything religiously speaking, but a guy told me, I'm going to unfriend you for that. I said, okay, take care. Okay, take care. I guess he thought I was going to lose sleep. We are not being beaten physically like they were in the first century. Their trials were physical. Our trials are mental, and it's a battle from within. We battle with our own courage. We're not battling. We're battling our own courage to stand for what we know is right. And we refuse to say things about what's right sometimes because we are afraid of the trial that's going to follow. Got to get some courage, y'all. You got people in here who stand with you. I'll be the first one. But regardless, if I don't stand with you and nobody else around stands with you, know that God is right there beside you. And you have nothing to fear. Notice what they did after they were beaten in verse 41. I thought these guys were crazy the first time I read this. Somebody just beat you? Watch this, verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The first time I read that, these guys are stone cold idiots. Somebody just beat them across the back. Somebody just beat them and they got up and said, <laughs> when last time one of y'all got a whooping? Tell the truth. Do not, don't, don't be over here acting like you don't too old to get whippings. Now, y'all know something. One of y'all got y'all back in and tore up last night, and you don't even want to tell me. Okay, think about the last time you got a whooping, if they did it right. If they did one, two, three in the corner, that's not a whooping. I'm talking about one, two, three. Three, then go to the corner. Last time you got a whooping, did you get up rejoicing? Thank you, mama. Thank you, daddy. Oh, I want to do it again. No, I didn't. When I was growing up, I didn't. As a matter of fact, my dad had to catch me every time he wanted to whoop me. And he caught me 85% of the time. I, if he ever let me get on a stretch and get wind up in third gear, it's over. Ain't no catching me. I make it to my grandmama house, and grandmamas and granddads, this is why you got to be one with your daughters and your sons and raising your grandkids, because they will use you against them. If I ever made it to my grandmama front door, and sometimes I used to have to run around the house, I, 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 I do like this right here, and I take off around the house, and by the time I make it to the front door, she got it open. I said, Ma! And I run up in the house, and my daddy get there and must say, you ain't touching my grandson. Home free. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I did that because I knew it worked. And let me tell you something. All these sweet, innocent children over here, it doesn't mean they're bad because they do that, but they learn as they grow how to get over. We all get over. How many of you went and bought a car and you tried to talk him down $2,000? Yeah. We're trying to get over. It's nothing wrong with getting over. You get a good deal, get a good deal. If you can get out of whooping, get out of a whooping. I, I, that's the second thing I said that ain't got nothing to do with my lesson. But it's some wisdom. When I, in that time it pops up here, I got to let it out. Somebody asked me the other day uh, when I was doing the gospel meet, you got some notes, brother, ever for your lesson? I said, huh. There you go. He said, what is this? I said, my notes. I said, look, bro, I, I, I just talk off the top of my head. 
So if you can't do nothing with that, you might better leave it alone. So if you see me go off a straight sometime, that's why I do that. I'm, uh, I'm unorganized. I'm sorry about that. Okay, and so when we look at how they respond to adversity, number one, they preach the word of God and they rejoice about it because in their mind, suffering for the cause of Christ in the eyesight of God, he considered them worthy. And when you suffer for Christ, God looks at you as a worthy soldier of the cross. Uh, the last one, benefiting from your trials. Let's look at how they benefited from their trials uh, in Acts. Look at Acts chapter 8. Now, here's church growth. And I, I have no doubt, even though this is a numerical, but this numerical growth came with spiritual growth. Anytime you teach somebody the gospel and they spiritually, in their mind, they're understanding, they grow in the understanding of what they need to do to become a Christian, and they become a Christian, that's spiritual growth that leads to numerical growth. No one becomes a child of God until their understanding gets in line with what they need to do and their heart tells them to do it. Spiritual growth that leads to numerical growth. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12 to 13, when Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, notice what it says. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. This persecution brought growth. And you know why it brought growth? Listen very close to growth. Persecution in and of itself is not going to bring growth. It's what happens from here where the persecution starts, over here where the growth is, is what happens in between that's going to determine growth. And here's what it is. Persecution, number one, my unrelenting life to continue to do the work of the Lord without distraction. Number two, growth. Number three, if you miss the middle, you never get over here to number three. If you miss number two, you will never get to number three, Roebuck. A lot of times the reason why churches are not growing has nothing to do with the preacher, has nothing to do with the elders, has nothing to do with the members, has nothing to do with the, uh, uh, I mean the deacons, has nothing to do with the members, has nothing to do with the, the, the audio, video uh, specialists, engineers. I'm trying to make you sound good. Man. It has nothing to do with anybody, and you can't point the finger at anybody. The moment you start pointing the finger at somebody to say why we're not growing, ask yourself, what did you do in the last six months to contribute to the effort? You know, when I first became a Christian, they taught me the great commission. Co-mission. And I, 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 I got bad English. Everybody can tell you that. I be, I, I be talking bad all the time, like then. I be talking. But last time I checked, a commission was people working together to do something. And, and last time I checked, also, carrying the gospel into the whole world was not just a church function. I think Jesus, when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, go teach all nations, I think when Jesus gave us a responsibility to teach, I don't think he was just talking to the church. I think he was talking also to us as individuals, meaning this right here. I don't have to wait on the church to set up a program to go do something. I don't have to wait on the church to go door knocking. When was the last time I had a meal over my house and I invited a non christian to my house and I said listen I, I, you know me and you've been friends a long time and I just wanted to invite you and your family over to my house we want to get, you know, get to know you a lot better we want to show you we care about you we would like time to time to have a story with you when was the last time you as an individual did that oh he preaching now amen when I'm tired of everybody talking about what's wrong with the church. I'm tired of everybody always talking about what's wrong with the preacher. What's wrong with the eldership? What's wrong with the deacons? What's wrong with this section of the members? What's wrong with that section of the members? What's wrong with these members who've been here 90 years? What's wrong with the young people who just came in? What's wrong with everybody? No, what's wrong with me? 
What have I done for God lately? Listen Listen to it a long time ago. What have you done for me lately? That's for y'all time. What have I done for the Lord lately? Not Roebuck. We got to get out of that mentality that other people are supposed to do our jobs for us when it comes to God. They're not. We work together as a church in the midst of trials and tribulations. Regardless of what's going on, we let nothing stop us. And when we do that, God can do this. God can bring growth. You had to turn around and see that, didn't you? Uh-huh. I stopped talking. I got it. God can do this. Right here. I made you turn around again. <laughs> all right, here we go. So, do I bring all this home? Church, listen up. That's my question to you. What say you? Roebuck. I'm talking to Roebuck. I'm talking to every member of the Roebuck Park with the Church of Christ. What say you? What, what say you about trials and tribulations? What say you about church problems? Are you going to let trials from the outside stop you from doing the work of the Lord, responding like you're supposed to respond? Are you going to allow problems from the inside? Stop you from doing the work of the Lord that you're supposed to be doing. And are you going to allow the problems that you have in your own individual life to stop you from doing the work of the Lord? What say you? What say you? Trials are hard. Trials are very hard. Especially when they happen from the inside. Friendships are broken. People who've known each other for 10 years don't even talk anymore. Families are broken up. Elderships are divided. People turn against each other. Trials are hard. But the reason why God gave us instructions is because he knew those things was going to happen. And he gave us instructions not to further deteriorate the situation. But he gave us instructions on how to fix the situation. And if we would just listen to the instructions, many of the church problems that we have can be fixed. And we can continue to do what we're supposed to do for the Lord. You will never, ever get rid of problems. I had a member tell me one time, and y'all better not be out on Facebook on me now. I see a couple of y'all been looking down for the last 20 minutes. I ain't turning to that many verses. Unless you still read Acts chapter 89, that's fine. I normally walk, walk around, but I've been a little. One spot tonight. We'll talk later. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Ye and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul questioned the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11. I hear that there are divisions among you. Don't be surprised when problems happen and trials happen, y'all. You can't be surprised. Something happens here and you bet, Lord, I'm leaving. I can't take this. Where are you going to go? You're going to go to another church that don't have problems? Good luck! i tell you what you do. If you decide to do that, call me. And I'm going to make a, a, a bet with you. I, don't, I haven't gambled in 15 years, but I'm willing to do this because I can become rich overnight. I bet you $1 million that I don't have that the next church you get to have problems. And you know what you're going to do? When you find the first problem, you're going to call me and say, no, brother, it was everything all right. Because you don't want to give up that $1 million. You will never find a perfect church, y'all. If you want this church to be what it should be, you make it that way. You make it that way. If you think it's lacking something, if you think that the church here is lacking to where we can't get to the growth we want, 
you begin to do something in your own individual life to help. Let's stop pointing the finger when trials come on the scene. You know, James 1 and 2 says, rejoice when you have trials because the trying of your faith produces patience. Patience is one of the benefits of church trials. When you go through difficult situations as a congregation together, you don't know this, but that difficult situation you go through, and you know what, it may happen this year, it may happen two times a year, it may happen once every three years, it doesn't matter. But each time you go through something as a church and you work through it the way God wants you to work through it, it's producing patience and it's making you the congregation God wants you to be. How many marriages do you know that have broken up at the first sign of trial? And how many marriages do you know that have lasted for 60 years and are unbreakable? You know why they're unbreakable? Because they battled every, they battled every storm you can throw at them. And once you've battled so many storms, and you've battled the most difficult storms, there's not many other things that can come into your life that can break you. Sometimes I sit around at the house, what's your name? You look like the guy that play on toys and the look, look good. That's why I kept looking at you. I ain't look at you, you know, I ain't funny. And I'm just, the guy, when trials come into your life, you know sometimes when I sit at the house and cry in my, in my man cave, which I do from time to time, my wife never knows when I do it. I'm down there crying my eyes out. And it's all about my, my family. What the best decision to make? Because I done made so many wrong decisions till. I'm scared sometimes. I'm scared sometimes. And I begin to think about Job. Job wouldn't do this because of the type of person he was, but if Job was here, he would look at me and say, <laughs> Told it. Is that all you got to worry about, brother? Come here. Give me a hug. If that's all you got to worry about, brother, you have nothing to worry about. Let me tell you what happened to me. I lost my family, all my daughters. I lost all of my sons. They were killed. I lost my home. I lost every material blessing I had. And my wife, who was left with me, she turned, told me to curse God and die. But I made it. I'm here. Tony. If that's all you have to worry about, brother, you need to be thankful and you need to be rejoicing. I can hear Job telling me that. And I can hear him telling you that as a church, everything that happens to you all are making you into a congregation that's going to be so strong that when the tough times do come, you'll be one to handle it. You may not see it. You may not see the silver line. I understand that. Darkness has the ability to cloud our minds about any future presence of light. I understand that. It gets so dark, you cannot imagine that you're going to see light. I understand that. But I remember the psalmist says that, uh, Weeping is only for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the psalmist never would have said that if he didn't have hope about life. And as a congregation, if you don't have hope in the Lord, then you don't have anything to hold on to. As I heard, turn your Bibles, if you will, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. We'll look at two verses here. Man, Jason, I'm about finished, man. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to 830. Verse Peter 5. And let's, let's start verse uh, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Listen, I'm talking to you, Roebuck. 
Follow along with me. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is walking around trying to see how he can get every one of you in this building to turn on each other. Your adversary, the devil, is walking around trying to see how he can destroy the Roebuck Parkway Church of Christ. Your adversary, the devil, is walking around trying to see how he can stifle growth. Trying to see how he can bring an end to growth. And if you allow his scheme to take root in your mind, then he is going to use you as one of his tools to accomplish it. The devil is smart. He knows he cannot stop you from attending church service. He knows how strong your faith is. So what he does is he begins to confuse you with problems to make you leave or run away or go somewhere else. That's his method, and too many times we fall for it. The boy is good. He got nothing else to do. He's not like us. We work. We have families to take care of. We, we, uh, uh, we vacation. You know, we got our life and we live our life. The devil doesn't have a life. His whole life is to destroy you. His whole life is to destroy the Roebuck Parkway Church of Christ. And he works seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, 365 days out of the year. 1.9387 seconds out of the year. That is so wrong. I just made that number up. And some of you are like, hey, amen. <laughs> well, I'll tell you the truth. Y'all better come on. I don't know how many seconds in a year, I don't really care. I know the days, that's all that matters. But he is spending quality time trying to destroy you, Roebuck. That's all he has to do. And he is spending quality time trying to get into you families and you individuals here. He is spending quali quality time trying to figure out how to make that married wife hate her husband that married man lose interest in his wife because he knows that if he can create problems in your home, it's going to affect Roebuck. He knows that. He is trying to get you hooked on some sin that's going to beset your life and turn you away from God because he knows if he can just get you to walk away from Roebuck, then that will affect Roebuck. This is all he has to do all day long. You've got to be smarter than him. Verse 9, resist him. Steadfast in your faith, knowing that the same suffering or trials are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God, and I want to leave you with this, Roebuck, but may the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you in your faith. That's my prayer for the congregation here. Don't give up. Hold on. Because in the end, you will see this over here. But only if you don't get distracted. Stop doing this right here. What? Say you, church. I intentionally left the R out to bother my grammar teachers in the audience. After every lesson, I say something intentionally wrong 20% of the time, and the other 80% is just naturally wrong. And I have one of the English teachers meet me at the door and say, Brother Elvis, you know what you said? I said, which one? And uh, it's a fun thing. But what say you, church? Appreciate you all listening so attentively to my lesson. We're in this battle together. We face some storms at Main Street. We've come through some battles at Main Street. And I'm telling you something. Whew. 
some of the battles that I've went through at Oak Ridge and we as a church have went through at Oak Ridge, it ain't worth the money they give me. Child, no. But you know what? I came to realize one time that that was Satan's trick. He said, Tony, look, man, look at your wallet. Look how broke you stay. Look at, your, look at your water. It was off the other day when you got home. This was last year. It was two times. One time I ain't had the money. One time I had the money in my pocket and forgot to pay it. <laughs> so I went to the Dollar General store and bought 10 gallons of water. And all of us took a bath with one gallon. That was a wonderful experience. You need to do that for your children one night. Cut the water off, go buy 10 gallons of water, and make them be resourceful. And tell you that, we'll raise a generation of kids who know how to make it. Ain't got to depend on nobody else. <laughs> but anyway, he was, the devil was, was, was trying to get me to see that, man, what I'm going through in this congregation ain't worth this. I just had two job offerings too. What I'm going through here is not worth this. I am going through all this for 18 people. Well, really, that's what my thinking. He was trying to get me. He was trying to get me from not thinking about going through this for God, and he started making me think about, he wasn't doing that. Come on, don't be writing letters talking about, Brother Elvis said the devil made him. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just sit down a minute. Goodness, y'all get so rowdy at Robust. And so I started to think. <laughs> He's embarrassing me. That's what they're saying. Yes, Lynn, you're one of my students. That's it. So, yes, you embarrassed? I'm fine. I don't care. And so he began to make me take my focus off God and put it on the situation. And I started thinking about those job offers. I'm telling you, 18 people, what I'm making, problems. 200 people, what I would be making, I'll deal with the problems. <laughs> and I said, no, nah, the devil, you're not, ta you're not taking my focus. And we've been together now six strong years. We're averaging about 40 members, and they're faithful. Notice I ain't said no change in the pay, but I love them. And I hope they love me. But I told the devil then, you're not going to make me lose my focus, bro. Get out of the way. And that's what I want you, Roebuck, to tell him when you feel like you want to stop. Thank you. Do I just come to an abrupt stop? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop. How do you say I'm, I'm finished?